Jim Dusing and I. Jim is in the School of Art. Uh, I'm Kathy Newman in English. Um, we are co-leading the media initiative for the next three years. And our goal is to start and inspire lots of interesting conversations about media and social change uh, on campus and hopefully bringing interesting people like we have today on campus and maybe getting off campus ourselves. Um, I just wanted to uh, tell everybody about our two uh, initiatives that are our two projects that we have under the initiative. The first is Listening Spaces with Rich Randall from the School of Music and Rich Purcell, um, who couldn't be here today. Um, they are, uh, their project is exploring how we interact with music from technological, social, and personal perspectives. Um, and they'll be working on this over the next three years. They have some really interesting plans, maybe a kiosk at Carnival at some point. Uh, they're also working on a, uh, a, an essay collection. Um, so we're really excited to have them uh, as part of the project and looking forward to seeing what they do. And Jim is going to talk right. also. Let me go grab this. Okay. You probably can all hear me, but I'm, why not use technology, right? <laughs> okay, now you can hear me. Uh, so I was going to introduce um, the other project that we uh, have going, which is Susie Silver's uh, Gender, Sexuality, and Media, uh, which is going to talk about um, gender, sexuality, <laughs> and representation. Um, and so it's going to be creating a web-based uh, variety show that um, Susie is calling a Dadaist variety show for the 21st century. And um, it's going to be titled Bait and Switch, and she's going to be teaching a class also called Bait and Switch, where um, materials for this are going to be produced. Um, also, um, as part of that, uh, Tom Kalin is going to be here uh, in, in March. And so on the, um, on the 30th of March, uh, there'll be a uh, 20th anniversary screening of his film Swoon at the Warhol. And on the 29th, um, he'll be here giving a talk on campus about his work. And also take the opportunity to mention another media um, event that we're doing on April 1st and 2nd, which is right after Tom Kalin is here. We're having a, an animation symposium in conjunction with Pittsburgh filmmakers. Um, and uh, uh, Aaron Cosgrove and Chris Sullivan are two animators who will be here. And Tom Sito is an uh, animator and an animation historian. And their work's going to be screened at Pittsburgh filmmakers on um, April Fool's Day. And um, on April 2nd, there's going to be a roundtable here on campus in the Giant Eagle Auditorium right across the hall. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all there, too. I'll give it over to Kathy now. Right. Okay, I'm pleased to introduce the members of our panel today. Um, we uh, have um, John Allison here, who's the opinion editor at the Post-Gazette. And I know that he recently reviewed... Um, a book about whether or not French parents are better. Uh, so you can check that out. Uh, Deanna Garcia, who's um, a fairly new reporter, is that true, for our wonderful, finally, it's about time, 24-hour-a-day news radio, essential uh, public radio. Um, and you also interned at NPR, is that right? So we're thrilled to have her here. Maria Lupinacci is an award-winning blogger, and I think of her... Um, contributions to two political junkies as she's kind of a media watchdog. She's probably had something to say about some of the other people sitting up here. Uh, wonderful, uh, really interesting blog. Uh, Tony Norman, a uh, beloved uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette <laughs> columnist, came wearing his reporter's fedora today. Yes. <laughs> and um, my favorite uh, piece of his in the last year is Why We the People Should Occupy America, which he wrote in October. Um, Chris Potter used to be my boss at City Paper when I was a TV columnist there. Um, one of the funniest uh, people I've ever known, great to have a beer with, um, and uh, also know, had his wonderful column for many years, uh, you had to ask things about Pittsburgh and now does Potter's Field. Um, Martha Rial, a per Pulitzer Prize winning photographer. Um, used to work for the Post Gazette, but I think is independent now. And are you working on something with Shaler Drilling right now? Yeah, I'm working on a project funded by the Pittsburgh Foundation and the Sprout Fund on the impact of Marcellus Shale Drilling. Mm -hmm. And I'm focusing primarily on Greene County. Oh, Great. my last name's pronounced Ryle. I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm sure that happens all the time. It does. So, Ryle. Um, and please <laughs> check out uh, her blog as well. Beautiful, uh, beautiful work. Uh, we're really uh, privileged to have everybody here. I'm going to go in the order that you're sitting, if that's okay. 
Uh, Chris brought slides, but he <laughs> promised to stay under his time limit. So I did not promise. <laughs> um, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, these wonderful journalists. So is this on? This is working. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'm going to try and do this slideshow quickly. I talk fast to begin with. I've only got a few minutes. Um, I'm going to be talking just some um, observations about new technology, how it affects reporters' relationships to papers, uh, the papers' relationship to the audience, and then also some considerations of design, because I understand that's an interest for people here. Um, the first idea, this is my uh, online avatar, just in case you're curious. Um, it's, I guess, a somewhat ironic choice. Uh, it's a typewriter, which is, of course, an outmoded technology. Um, and sock monkeys are, of course, the oldest art form known to man. Um, I just mention it because one of the things to think about is um, the way new technology has turned reporters into brands in some way. Um, I mean, I chose this image uh, intentionally and ironically, um, but to some extent, any reporter who's got their own Twitter account uh, begins to take on an identity separate from the paper uh, that they work for, which is something that's different. A um, hundred years ago, there weren't even bylines. Um, so we are watching a change and emerging relationship between those things. Um, I was contractually obligated to include a quote from Marshall McLuhan <laughs> um, because we're talking about media uh, and how it's disrupted things. Um, I want to submit oops, um, that although this is a really uh, popular quote to drop around, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us, um, one of the things I'm going to argue is, is that uh, reporters and editors fight being reshaped by our tools as much as we possibly can. Case in point, myself. This is the actual uh, flip phone <laughs> that I use. I don't have an iPhone phone or any of that stuff. This is it right here. Um, and that's what it takes to type out the message, iPhones are bourgeois, deal with it. Um, I mention this just because um, if your tool shape you, um, all of my thoughts about social media are probably about 14 years old. Um, I am what they call a late adopter. I only recently started my own Twitter account. I only have a couple hundred followers. Um, and the reason for that is I used to use the official city paper account. Um, the reason I no longer do that is because, oh my god, sorry. The reason I no longer do that is because I tend to write posts like this. Um, oh, hey guys, city paper investigators have learned Marty Griffin isn't a person at all, but 12 Marmots bundled up in a French coat. Um, Marty Griffin, for those of you who don't know, is a reporter for KDKA TV who just sometimes seems to um, make stuff up, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to leftists and their supposed threat to uh, civil order. Um, I want to defend my reporting here. Um, I submit this as evidence. That's Marty Griffin on the left and a marmot on the right. Um, the reason I don't tweet this stuff on the city paper account is because it just looks weird to have your official city paper um, brand identity out there. People retweeted that particular tweet, um, including the Post Gazette's uh, television uh, writer, which I was gratified by. Um, but the idea here is that. When you're tweeting under your own account, you're able to do it with a bit of personality. Um, that's the upside of social media. The downside of it sometimes, for, especially for younger reporters, is where does the personal stop, where does the professional begin? If I'm tweeting stuff for my job, can I also use that same Twitter account to tweet stuff to my family members? What do I write about on Facebook? Is, that, um, uh, is it fair for me to carry on regular conversations with people I went to college with? We once had a situation where a intern um, was going to cover some uh, anti-war protests, went onto her Facebook account and said, oh, I'm going to go cover a bunch of hippies now, that'll be fun. Uh, the problem is the hippies also have Facebook and then were offended by uh, her attitude, it was a real shit storm. Um, all of that said, um, I would just point out, this stuff is powerful and even I've used it. This is um, some tweets I did while reporting on layoffs that have been taking place at uh, Education Management, the, pay, the parent company of um, the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Um, you know, in some ways, that entire story was summed up by one tweet, which is, cabs lined up outside EDMC offices and stripped to take employees away. Ex-worker told the EDMC is paying fair, quote, because now they can afford it. <laughs> it sums up the entire uh, reality of being laid off. Um, this, too, was a story, this, too, was a case where I used Twitter to build an interest in reporting we were doing online. Um, so the, the online reporting fed into the Twitter account, the Twitter account fed into online. Sometimes, in fact, I have used social media. This is, these are tweets I did during the, the trial to remove Occupy Pittsburgh. Um, uh, and you can see that essentially, um, this is all the reporting that I did. I mean, these tweets like this, this is just a sampling. I never wrote a story, I just filed tweets from there. One interesting thing that we reporters have to deal with from time to time is other institutions have not caught up with social media. Um, courtrooms are very hostile to um, the open display of cell phones uh, in a courtroom, so I had to run out into the hall and do this. Um, everybody thought I had a bladder infection, probably. <laughs> um, this will seem an entirely random thing. This is an ant being infected. Um, 
has been basically killed by a fungus. Uh, Cordyceps loidae is a uh, mushroom in the uh, South American rainforest um, that contains toxins that when insects eat it, the insect is impelled to climb up to the highest tree um, it can find in the forest, fasten itself to a branch, and then die. The fungus then uh, reproduces itself, and because the ant is so high up, the wind carries the spores of the fungus um, the maximum distance possible. I'm um, moving right along. <laughs> I don't actually mean this, um, the problem with social media society, but that's sometimes the attitude reporters and editors have. I don't mean to embarrass anybody, but this is um, something that, strangely, both of our daily newspapers, neither of them have comments on most of their uh, newspaper stories. Maybe John or Tony can explain why that is. Um, some of the op-ed pieces do have comments. The Post-Gazette often directs people to their Facebook page. Um, but it's a singular thing about this market, that the two dailies do not actually have comments enabled. Um, they're much smaller and much larger papers that have that going on. That said, I tend to sympathize um, because when you do have comments on your site, life is difficult. Um, I'm also unusual in that I mix it up with readers quite a bit. Um, this is a post, a, a little dialogue between a guy, Purvis Youngblood, who trolls our site from time to time, pretending to be a black guy from Homewood. Right. Um, I've allowed him to do that for a while, but finally he did a post in Ebonics that was just absurd, so I just called him out on it. Um, there aren't many editors who probably get into this um, level of discourse, and there's probably a good reason for that. Um, but I tend to mix it up with people. I was just arguing with somebody about a blog post I did uh, a little while ago today. This is Yaroslav Flager. As you can probably tell by looking at him, he is a Czech scientist who's studying whether your cat is driving you crazy or not. <laughs> um, there's an article in The Atlantic about this. Um, cats carry an intestinal um, parasite um, uh, that can only reproduce inside the cat's intestine. So the parasite, the way the parasite gets in there is by infecting rodents and making them more risk um, uh, engage in riskier behavior, like running out uh, into the middle of your kitchen so they can be eaten by the cat. Yaroslav Flager argues that, um, in fact, humans are also affected by this without even knowing it. One piece of evidence for that is that um, diagnoses of schizophrenia didn't really become common in Europe until uh, people began owning cats on a <laughs> widespread basis. Um, for those who are interested in design, I just wanted to point out uh, some very uh, quick ways in which I design. This is, our two, this is the redesign we did in 2005. Um, as you can see, it's the perfect redesign for a newspaper publishing in 1998. Um, I'll just point out that, uh, for example, you can see that rap hit, that line up there. That was sort of the main feature story. We tended to link to a lot of our stories and sort of treat the website as a once a week kind of publication. Um, very static presentation, uh, not a lot of variation from day to day. There are, you can see web only, there are some blogs there. Um, but they really only got updated once a day, if that often. This is the redesign we just launched. Um, it's our 2012 redesign, so it's cutting edge for 2005. Um, what you can't really tell is there's a lot more animation on it. The photo that's at the top there, the, those two gentlemen, that photo rotates in and out. It's not necessarily the biggest story. Um, they can, these photos can link to a variety of stories, including blog posts. Um, you can see that the listings module there for people to search is there. Much higher prominence given to the online um, component of this. You can't quite see it because it's just below the scroll, as they say. Uh, but we also have links to our Facebook page and um, also uh, our Twitter account as well. So there's a lot more interaction going on there. Um, I want to point out for designers here, I want to suggest that you designers may be responsible for making Americans dumber. Um, and the reason I say that is because no matter what the design challenge is, the answer is always fewer words, more white space. Um, to the uh, right there, you can see this is, this is a, some excerpts from uh, recommendations recently made from our vendor about how to optimize a website for when we go to a tablet presentation, which we haven't done. Um, as you can see, white space is your friend. Make the fonts big. Make the pictures big. Small, dense lists are out. Um, generally, text is out. Uh, sometimes you get the feeling from designers that designing newspapers would be great if it weren't for all the fucking articles and words. Um, you can take a look there at an example. This is a successful design, apparently, recommended to us uh, by a paper in California. Um, this is about Occupy. This is about their Occupy movement and um, the occupation of homes that have been um, uh, foreclosed on. It's a huge, big story. It gets about four paragraphs. But by God, some of the photos look great. And look at all the white space. Yeah. Um, I, just, I just think there's a serious challenge there to be met, and designers are just telling people to make stuff look pretty, and I don't think we're getting any smarter as a result. Um, this is the, one of the key questions I want to leave you with. Um, you know, uh, there was a report earlier today by CNN um, that Patch.com, which is AOL's attempt to create hyper-local reporting, um, is going belly up. Uh, AOL spent $160 million on it and has lost all but $25 million of it apparently last year. Um, newspapers are losing money hand over fist online. Um, 
the online sites tend to pay for themselves, but you could never you could never finance a newspaper or outlet based on online revenue, and yet we have given it away for free. Um, it's not entirely clear why, but we're not alone in that. You yourself probably are on Facebook providing content that Mark Zuckerberg benefits from um, and profits from mightily. You yourself are not being compensated at all. Um, I just want to suggest, although it seems to make sense to you um, to do that, it also made sense for that ant to climb up um, the branch of that tree, and it makes sense for rats to run out in the middle of the kitchen. We are not always entirely aware of what we're doing, and I just want to submit that Mark Zuckerberg may be infecting us somehow. As my final thought, um, this is my 10-month-old uh, uh, child, Cormac. As you can see, he is destroying a, um, a magazine. <laughs> Obviously, I've never been more proud. This concludes my presentation. <laughs> Thank you.